well, we'll get right to it. Um, so here we go. I'm going to have to kind of move around as the sun is always threatening my image here. Um, okay, so I'm going to welcome you. So welcome, uh, Dr. Dan Johnson. I'm really uh, happy to have you. And uh, so here we go with your bio here. All right, um, let's hear this. All right, so Dr. Dan Johnson is a forest ecologist who's into community and spatial ecology. Dan studies these fields in his lab uh, at the Global Forest Dynamics Lab at the University of Florida. Dan's Twitter handle is at Dan Big Tree Man. Awesome, by the way. Dan's, uh, oh, it reveals he's into trees, rocks, and water, education, inspiration, and let's fix this shit. All I needed to know, to know I am so excited to have Dan and have a chat with him. So there we go. That's your, that's your bio, Dan. Yeah, right. <laughs> and Half of that is literally your bio. So yeah. 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 It's what I wrote on Twitter. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> I have to credit my Twitter handle to my nieces. They used to call me Dan, Dan, the big tree man. And oh, that's that cool that would not fit in um, the, the Twitter limit. So I just that, yeah. <laughs> you had to pare it down. Yeah, no, that's cool. I like that. Um, yeah, it says what you are and what you do. So, so uh, if we could start with just who is Dan, the big tree man? And, you know, like, <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you do and how did you kind of get there? So in any order oh, and however you want to fashion that. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I had a, a pretty non-traditional route to ending up being a professor. I, uh, <laughs> I started undergrad thinking I wanted to be an astrophysicist. Um, oh. I spent a couple of years in physics and realized I wasn't a physicist. <laughs> um, but uh, um, yeah, uh, but I got really interested in the outdoors and the Smoky Mountains actually probably are a lot of the reason why I was always interested in forests, but that really sparked my curiosity and uh, yeah, I got an undergrad in forestry and um, then worked for various, I worked for the state government in Indiana, I'm from Indiana, um, and uh, did all sorts of stuff for the state. Um, division of forestry and then i worked for the forest service for about six years doing forest inventory analysis which is uh our national forest inventory program yeah very and important so work. Of, yeah yeah i counted the trees of indiana for six years and uh what could be done it was really I, I wanted the skills to be a lot of potential there uh, especially I came in right at 2000 when they were um, annualizing the inventory and making a national course. Of um, we've been collecting things regionally. So it's really hard to compare, you know, the South to the North to the West. Um, and now everything is done pretty much the same way everywhere. Um, so now we, and going forward, that's the plan. So we're going to have this great trajectory what are what's happening in the U.S. forest? So that really sparked my curiosity to go back to school and um, get an advanced degree and get into research. Uh, so it was it was mostly a love for forests and then um, some decent quantitative skills and uh, and an interest in learning more, knowing more, fixing this shit somehow. Yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> No, that's cool. That's really cool. And speaking of fixing stuff, your background, I mean, that that definitely leads into how we can fix some shit, you know? Um, yeah. And, and Dan, like, I want you to take this however, whichever way you want. Um, but how? How do we fix shit? Well, that that's, yeah, there, there's a lot to unpack there. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, so I, I've been in Florida. Um, for a little over two and a half years. And while I think there's a lot the country shouldn't be taking from Florida, um, one of the things that I'm really impressed with is the use of prescribed fire. 
um, in systems that have historically had fire and how well accepted, widespread, and relatively safe. I mean, things get away sometimes, but for the most part, those are preventing even worse situations um, from happening. And so I've been really impressed with fire. So this is this is actually a prescribed fire that happened on a research area that I have uh, here in central, North Central Florida. Um, and so I was thinking about what to do for my background because I don't have a, I don't have a, a real nice uh, <laughs> like fire pit or anything I could go out and hang out by, but I was like, I do have fire pictures. And I think it's, it's pretty pertinent and important these days to be talking about the use of prescribed fire. I'm no expert in it, um, but I'm really impressed with how it works here. And it seems like it's a thing that we could export um, and, and do a better job of elsewhere to prevent catastrophic fires. Um, yeah. In these systems that have historically had fire um, and the species are adapted for that um, and we've let them go, uh, you know, it's the tragedy of Smokey the Bear. Yes, we yeah. don't want to burn things down, but at the same time, um, it's supposed to burn. It's uh, supposed to burn. Uh, yeah. It has historically burned. And if you don't, you're going to get big, bad burns that kill lots of trees. Right. So these, yeah. these people are sort of amazing. Two weeks after fire, it's green again. And it's, it's just they sprout right back and the species just go on with their lives. Um, for the most part, I mean, it thins things out, but that's what it's, that's why it's a, a management tool. So um, yeah, yeah I, I do feel like this is one of the uh, ways to fix some things, but not everything. Obviously you can't, like fire doesn't belong everywhere, but um, right. it is, I, I did intentionally choose this background because it was a, A, it's on my research area that I thought I might talk about, but then B, it's, I think it's a tool that we need to learn how to accept as a society um, a little bit better. Yeah, no. Yeah, I mean, I, a, I completely agree with everything you said. <laughs> and B, uh, you know, I, I've got two things that kind of came up for me when you were talking about, uh, well, going into your background and how that's part of a solution for certain regions that are fire adapted or even uh, fire dependent, right? Certain species that are fire dependent. Um, so, you know, you brought up my background, which is uh, historically this narrow strip that runs north and south down into Texas uh, and up into southern Kansas. And this is the cross timbers, right? This is the post oak and uh, blackjack oak dominated forest. However, so you can see the post oaks with their marcescent brown leaves hanging on behind me. But behind that is uh, our, it's basically empty. A future neighbor might move there someday. And uh, it's full of, um, which all these are native, most of these are native species anyways, but they're really thick with um, elms, with uh, hackberry, uh, sugarberry, with, uh, we do occasionally get uh, silver maple in there, which, you know, is not, um, I think it's naturalized here, but it's not native. Um, and uh, all these other kind of music, more music species, and it's super thick. It's uh, because it's not burned. And the fire studies that have, that have been done around in Oklahoma kind of illustrate that we should be burning um, anywhere from every two to kind of, you know, depends on the, like you, like you talked about, it depends. Not everything needs the same fire regime, doesn't have the same fire history and needs. But because this isn't burning, we're really setting ourselves up for this big shift um, in plant community. Uh, you know, a lot of the oaks are not regenerating in the understory um, because they need that light and they get that historically by being burned um, and, and, you know, creating more light for them. Um, so, sorry, I, I, I can just like oof, jump right in there, but uh, no, it, it speaks to exactly what you're saying. Um, and, and, and then another thing that came up for me was it, I feel like this stat is correct. Like, isn't Florida like the um, number one state for the most lightning strike, maybe most lightning strikes, and maybe it was also lightning strike caused fires, which, you know, it makes sense. They should correlate somewhat. Is that accurate? 
Yeah, no, it, it is it is right um, that Florida. Well, so what happens is we get lots of convective storms from the Gulf water mm. hitting the um, Atlantic water. Atlantic, yeah, uh, yeah. The air masses boil up these convective storms and create a lot of lightning. Um, so we just have a lot okay. of clouds that make lightning from this meeting of air masses over the peninsula. Um, so in the summertime, we get this, especially where I am in this in central. So we're I'm about in the very middle of Florida where it starts to become a peninsula. And um, in the summertime, it's like monsoon season, where every afternoon, four o'clock or so, these clouds just bubble up and a rainstorm happens. And often there's lightning with it. And so, yeah, Florida has a lot of lightning. Southern Georgia, you know, that that the southern coastal plain, um, yeah. highest lightning strike area in the country, in the U.S. You know, there are probably other places in the world that have more, but. So yeah, I, there's plenty of sources of ignition historically. You know, people ask, well, where did the fires come from? And that's a, that's a very obvious one. And Native Americans would have used it as well um, as a tool. And or um, so that you know, it's it, this region has historically burned, and um, yeah. and and the forests that were here uh, definitely were were geared up for that. And, and the return cycle was about two to seven years, they think. Just okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so I've, I've put in a big research plot here in a longleaf pine forest uh, that's we part of the Smithsonian Institution's forest geo network of um, research plots where these are big areas where we map and measure and identify everything uh, centimeter in diameter and larger across typically uh, 25 hectares. So what that's like 60 some acres. Um, and I put one in here in this longleaf pine forest on the sand hill, sand hill type. So it's really deep sandy soils, um, very xeric uh, conditions, but hugely diverse understory that's fire dependent, uh, herbaceous species, and then dominated by these longleaf pines. It's a really fascinating ecosystem that I didn't really know too much about before I got here and been learning a lot. So I, I'm, I feel like I'm a novice again in a lot of ways where I'm, I mean, I find myself in a new ecosystem, like, okay, let's dig in and figure out where I'm at because I, I love to work locally uh, traveling. I, I like to think about forests globally. That's the aspirational title of my lab because yeah. the Johnson is boring, but um <laughs> You know, I, I aspire to think about forest globally, and that's why I work with these networks. You know, then I think of the FIA as a network, but then the Forest Geo Network takes it globally. Yeah. The same methods, um, doing the same, you know, collecting the same data so we can compare forests around the world and look at change through time. And uh, so that's one of the things I'm really excited about is uh, these big networks. But then learning about this new ecosystem that I'm in uh, and how really cool it is like it used to cover well there's debate right but it it was once the dominant forest type in the southeastern coastal plain and yeah. now it's been reduced to three to five percent of its original range through just fire exclusion and homes and you know land use change and um so it's really a, a, a it's a focus of a lot of restoration efforts too so it's been fun to learn about that and Try to understand this new place I'm in. Um, yeah. No, that's no, that's really cool. Uh, you know, a lot of scientists. Well, I say a lot. I, I really don't know. I have no, no no data on this, so I really shouldn't speak to it. But I know I do know that there are some people for sure that are able to just uh, bed down and you know like uh, study you know you know the tundra for their whole entire life you know or study longleaf pine for their whole entire life and uh it i'm sure you know like you mentioned it it presents challenges of having to readjust and learn a whole new dynamic um and that's something i wanted to ask you about uh as i you know looked at your your uh your lab's website um is you know i discovered you also have done a lot of work or at least you've done some work in uh los alamos national lab which is completely different, you know, than the Southeast, uh, for sure. Uh, so can you kind of speak to that? Like, what are, what are maybe some of the challenges? And then what did you see at Los Alamos or some of the other places you've been 
and how do you kind of here's here, sorry here's there's yeah. just so many questions sorry i've got like 50 firing but um for you but you mentioned what is you know there's this global aspect so you know there's kind of this movement to uh to just plant you know trillions of trees right and we know that sure some places need lots more trees some places need way less trees, right? They need to be restored. You talked about the, the uh, longleaf pine forest in the Southeast and how it used to be so expansive and amazing. And same way with like the Great Plains, it used to be super expansive. And now it's like, I, I the, the grassland ecologist is gonna just kill me on this, but like, I feel like it's like 3%, something kind of like what you have um, with the longleaf, but of what it used to be. So- yeah. Can you kind of speak a little more to this diversity globally and um, kind of trends you see or or what are those di- global dynamics that you see and from your experience? Yeah, so um, I, I noticed you were just in New Mexico, right? You just got back from mm-hmm. the trip to New Mexico. And yeah, that's why yeah. it really piqued my interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was a postdoc at Los Alamos for a little over a couple of years, uh, working with Nate McDowell and Chung Eng Shu. Um, and it's funny, I was, you know, I was at Los Alamos, which is up in the mountains at 7,500 feet. And um, right at the, the break in juniper pinion at mm. forest type and ponderosa fir sorts of forests. Yeah. And really beautiful, just a Oh man, that place is gorgeous. I love Northern New Mexico. Um, and, but I was studying tropical forests when I was there. Uh, so working in Nate's lab, I was working with um, multiple national labs on this, uh, they call it NG Tropics project, where they're trying to improve how we're modeling uh, tropical forests and earth system models. And um, I worked on a cross-site analysis of 14 tropical forest geoplots to look at tree mortality. Um, And and so these big earth system models um, that they're working on developing and and improving, they've already developed them, but improving them and how we represent tropical or or terrestrial carbon cycling and tropical forests is one of the places where we have limited knowledge, right? Most, Most researchers live in the temperate zone. Um, (laughs) We have a lot of information about the temperate zone, but um, tropical forests are A, super diverse, and B, um, somewhat inaccessible. Um, And so uh, what I did was I looked at tree mortality in these plots, trying to understand um, how they, how their mortality varied by the size of the tree, right? So it's, we kind of think about mortality rates as the static thing. It's like right. trees fall two percent per year, and that's kind of how it, those Earth system models used to say trees die at two percent a year. That's it, and then there was no variation. It was just <laughs> yeah. like there's background mortality, and they and and they're building in mechanisms, right? And they want to make sure they're getting the right answer for the right reasons. So they're trying to build in the right mechanisms. And what I worked on was just trying to understand well, how are trees dying in the tropics? Just the baseline. What's what's happening? How does it vary? across all the tropics, um, or as much as I had data to talk about. Um, And so I was in this kind of high desert forest situation, but thinking about tropical forests the whole time I was there. Um, So yeah, it was a little bit of a weird experience and Los Alamos is a a weird, amazing place. Um, Tiny little mountain town with highest per capita PhDs in the world, I think. Um, you go to a grocery store, you know, it's like a 20,000 person town, but you'd hear six languages at the grocery store there. It was a really wow. cool experience. It was, That's it, was awesome. very odd. it was a very odd place to live and work, but um, it was really great, um, really great group of people. Um, but, you know, it's funny, Nate McDowell, the, who was my postdoc advisor, is giving a talk right after we talk at, um, about rising rates of tree mortality. And mm. this idea that the globally tree mortality is going up um, and in the Anthropocene, right? So the yeah. age of humans, 
And, and what are we doing to cause increases in tree mortality and what can we expect from the future? Um, and I, 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 I think we are increasing tree mortality rates. It varies quite a bit across the range of the world <laughs> of, of forests. So I think the jury's still out and that's one of the things I'm really interested in is trying to just understand, well, how are things living and dying um, and how's that changing? You know, if I had a time machine, I would go back and put in long-term research plots a long time ago. Yeah. So we had better baseline data um, of what was going on. Uh, there's other things I probably do too, but um, that's that's one thing that I just keep, <laughs> I'm, keep coming back to like, yeah, forest data, 100, 200 years ago, 400, 1,000 years ago, what's, what do we, and I know we have, you know, dendrochronologists can give us some insight into that and, uh, pollen records and all that, but uh, real dynamics of how forests were changing um, would, yeah. been, would be really cool <laughs> to have. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, I don't, I don't know if did you, uh, you know, of uh, uh, newly minted Dr. William Hammond. Are you familiar with him yeah, at Oklahoma like State? Him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he's he's like my best friend because we happen to go to the same regional school. We we'll have got, our humble humble roots. <laughs> yeah. I gather that from Twitter. Yeah, yeah. I can tell you two were close from Twitter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, we actually know each other in real life. It's kind of weird. Um, it seems seems so fragmented now, you know, to have that. But uh, you know, he um that. Uh, Kind of forgot where I was going with this, but um, I'll, I'll go yeah, another direction. Let's see, maybe we'll end up the same way. So he, uh, you know, I know he really brought that world to me to light to me about um, global tree mortality, the uh, tree mortality network. I probably global. I, I probably messed it up. I'll link it eventually. I'll look it up correctly yeah. later. Yeah. Um, but I know, you know, obviously that's something you're in the know about. It's it's what you study as well. Um, you know. It, it really uh, something from his talk is seeing how we know so little, but we're increasing our knowledge, right? Because we're starting to do more studies. We're realizing how huge of an issue this is globally um, and, and figuring out how, and actually qu trying to quantify how, how big of an issue it is. And then what are the drivers, all that stuff, uh, drought, hotter droughts, um, these episodic droughts that are, hotter and and abnormal historically speaking um but you're you you really nailed it to me is like we're trying so hard now like catching up trying to figure out what's going on right now but unfortunately we really can't know exactly what happened in the past and uh it, it's it's a very i guess this whole the whole point that i'm trying to make is it, I, I am just a huge admirer of, let me pull back and just say, as a dendrochronologist, it, I mean, I literally could just grab my increment borer, my Hagloff borer, go right over here to this sugar berry or right over here to this post oak and tell you a lot of stuff about it, right? You know, I could tell you this growth rate and at what point did it, you know, was it increasing like this in growth? Is it slowing down and, and compare that to drought and uh, climate variability, all this stuff, right? But I can't speak at all to what's happening, you know, globally, right? This is just a local phenomenon, um, or or maybe even that individual tree, you know, uh, phenomenon. But uh, the work that you and others are doing, I mean, this is this is not an easy task, right? And uh, but everybody's kind of got their little niche or their little part. What, so what from here, like what, this is, this is kind of, sorry, I'm building to the, to an eventual question here. Okay. This is it. So where do you go from here? Like what to, to try to understand the diversity that's necessary, the fire regimes that are necessary, uh, species shifts your range shifts you know due to climate change due to other variables what is the focus on in your lab and in other labs like how do we kind of get to um an answer how do we kind of get to that answer of how do we fix this shit <laughs> I, I, uh, I know i know I, that is not an easy setup or an easy answer 
but I, I would like to kind of like just kind of could you give like an update like what does the science tell us now and yeah. what should the the focus the focus be for different regions or for you you know i think you hit the nail on the head a lot where we're trying to catch up and get enough data to project right so a lot of efforts going into trying to scale up from these individual observations. So forest geoplots plots are amazing, right? We, we measure everything in 60 acres and track it through time. Um, you know, you, you go out and measure that, that sugar berry, but that's the one that made it. What about the yeah. thousands of little ones that you can't core at all? Oh yeah, them? that's good. You know, that's the survivor. That's the one in a million, that one won the lottery sort of yeah. tree. Yeah. So what's happening with all of that other stuff? It doesn't really matter. Um, depends on what you're interested in. Uh, you know, is it carbon? Is it diversity? Uh, carbon, only the winners really matter, right? Most of the biomass is in the big trees. So yeah. um, I don't care about what happens to the little trees, but what makes up those big trees eventually started as little trees. Um, so yeah, is it deterministic who makes it through the lottery or is it just a random draw out of the pool of, all the lucky candidates. Um, I don't know. Uh, so I think we're doing a lot of catch up of trying to nail down what's driving a, it, where is there increased mortality or decreased mortality? That's certainly a possibility, right? Climate change means that things are changing and changes in lots of different ways, depending on where you are in the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly increasing droughts can't be a, a great thing for a lot of systems. Um, but places, there are other places that aren't going to see that. They're going to see increases in rainfall and, or, you know, so what do landslides do? And I, I think it's, it becomes a really complicated question. And I think mm -hmm. uh, I really like the team base sort of, we're only going to accomplish this by working together, right? There's yeah. no, it's like working in a silo and not talking to other people is not going to work anymore. Um, so you know, I'd love to see that, and, and that's happening, right? There, there is an emphasis on co big collaborations and team science um, because one person can't do it all. Um, and that's why I like being involved with these big networks is you do your part, but then you're working together with everyone um, to, to try to push for our knowledge base. <laughs> I don't know how we fix this shit yet. Um, that is, that is that's a trillion dollar question. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I rely a lot on saying, well, we just need to understand things better. Um, yeah. and, and then we'll have, well, the solutions will become clearer. Um, but I think, you know, there, there's the work on your local system to improve whatever it is you're, you have access to and how we're, we're approaching it um, to make it a more sound and sustainable system. Um, yeah. Uh, man, I don't know. That's, I don't have yeah. any answers. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Not yet. No, uh, not yet. you know, I, I just, you know, something that just came up for me as I was just thinking like, you know, the, the, you uh, global dynamics people, um, you remind me a lot, like you, you mentioned, like uh, the collaboration is such a big key. Everybody's got to do their little part in their little region. You remind me really of like a virologist studying like pandemics, right? This is kind of likened to a pandemic of global tree mortality. And everybody's got to kind of track their own thing. They've got to collaborate. This is what we're seeing. We've got pathogens here and we've got you know, fungi that's attacking and invasive species. And it really does take this huge collaborative collaboration you know to pull it off okay there, so I, I think that oh, analogy is great i think that analogy is great but add in the community context where it's not just humans that we're thinking about and one mm. disease but we're thinking about hundreds of you know, tens of thousands of species potentially and lots of interactions um yeah, yeah. It, becomes, it, it does require uh, a lot of work at individual levels and team levels and um you know Hopefully someday we, there's some global coordination that, that happens that's um, meaningful and solid. Uh, that's, yeah. No, that's great. I like that. Okay. So we've got, I, I know you've got like four minutes. So let me let me just steal you really quick. Okay. Right here. Or steal you right, right here. Okay. So 
What is your favorite tree species? Uh, easy. Eastern hemlock. Um, oh, I love oh, cool. It. I love it for its tenacity. So there's some glacial relic populations in Indiana that grow in these like cool box canyons along creeks. Yeah. So we'll find it on north facing slopes above creeks. That's the only place I've been able to hang on and going for hikes there. And then in the Smokies, um, I love how hemlock will fall off a cliff, turn around and grow back up. I just love the tenacity of that species. So that's cool. Uh, awesome. And, and I'm, I'm really sad about EAB uh, the, or the woolly adelgid. The yeah, 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 yeah. Um, EAB is bad too, but the woolly adelgid. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, yep, that was easy next wow that's awesome i love that tree too yeah i i haven't even seen it if i've seen it i haven't even known i've seen it but i like i feel you know i'm so ignorant and i'm so like stuck i need to i need to go that way so i've got to get out east and up north that's really cool um okay what's your favorite food fireside food and beverage <laughs> uh yeah you didn't include food in the the prelim questions oh but, um... oh okay well just, <laughs> hey do what you're comfortable with. Okay. I'm all about, you know, I don't want to pressure anybody. So, <laughs> uh, so, you know, I, I think depending on the evening, it's either hot chocolate or a dark beer. Um, yeah. just depending on how the evening's going. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which way it's going. Um, all right. Yeah. But I don't know about food. That's okay. I like, food. I like food. I, I'm generally pro food. Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. I, I, I may be a little more pro food than I should be, um, especially during the quarantine. Okay. That's Dan. I, I like, we really just talked a lot about the issues and, and didn't really chat about you as much. Uh, and I would love to have you on in the future and I'll be on time and we'll be just more leisurely and not so That's focused cool. on all yeah. the issues but you know, uh, one thing, yeah i i've really enjoyed i've reached out to people in this pandemic the people that i haven't talked to for a long time or, and, and just reconnected and it's such we're meeting new people this is awesome it's one of the maybe good side effects of all of this yeah. as we became isolated enough that we started thinking about intentionally reaching out uh, more um so i appreciate it i i really i had fun and i'd love to come back and and have a uh, or two uh we can talk about not so serious stuff or something yeah all right awesome dan thank you so much thanks for your patience thanks for explaining things to me and uh thanks for telling me about that relic population or or populations of eastern hemlock in india that's really cool i love those relic yeah. populations sorry see i'm already trying to go i'm trying to steer us away again okay we need to wrap it up <laughs> yeah let's check out the range map of hemlock okay. you'll see these little blocks around little and yeah it's cool little, little circles out in the middle of nowhere i yeah. love that i love that okay yeah. Yeah. all right dan thank you so much i'll let you go and uh, we'll talk we'll talk again yeah see you soon all right See you, Joe. All right. Bye.